Welcome to this talk. Uh, my name is Dan Hill. I'm a visiting professor of practice at UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And I'm also the director of strategic design at Vinova, the Swedish government's innovation agency. I'm going to be chairing today's discussion. Uh, a big welcome to you all. Um, we're delighted so many people can join us. We have a, a great panel who are arriving in, in pieces, if I can say that. Um, just so you know a bit about IIPP, uh, IIPP, the Institute is a department within University College London, part of the Bartlett Faculty, which is known for its radical thinking about space design and sustainability. IIPP has a mission to change how public value is imagined, practiced and evaluated to tackle societal challenges to deliver economic growth that is innovation-led, sustainable and inclusive. Finding solutions to global challenges by bringing a missions approach to industrial, innovation and development strategies. And today's discussion is about transforming the use of materials for a green deal. So hopefully you're in the right seminar. <laughs> um, it's going to be a real pleasure to introduce you to our event speakers. I'll do this in reverse order of the way they're going to speak, actually. So uh, first of all, we have Tanushri Shukla, who is coming to us from India, which is great. And um, we just compared notes. I think she's about 20 degrees centigrade warmer than I am here in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, but Tanushri is a social entrepreneur and sustainability consultant with a focus on the textile and apparel industry. She has expertise in innovative textile waste management practices and systems, as well as social impact generation. She also has a background in digital product development and content strategy. So welcome to Nushri. Uh, Saskia Sassen uh, is the Robert S. Lynn Professor of Sociology and former chair for the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University. And is now also, a, we're really happy to say, an honorary professor at IIPP. She has written numerous books, which include Cities in a World Economy and Expulsions, Brutality and Complexity in the Global Economy. Carlotta Perez is a pioneering scholar on the role of innovation and also an honorary professor at IIPP. Her focus is on the circular economic impact of technical change and historical context of growth and development. And we're going to start with Carlotta in a moment. Just a brief background on myself. My name is Dan Hill, as I said. I'm a designer by background, urban design, strategy, those kinds of things, working with cities all over the world. Um, but also a product and industri industrial interaction designer, sometimes with industrial things as well. So I've worked at both of those scales, cities and products. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a moment. Currently, I work for the Swedish government um, here in Stockholm, where I'm a director of strategic design in the innovation agency. And also, as I said, delighted to say I'm a visiting professor of practice at IIPP. So each of our speakers is going to have an opportunity to speak on their opinions, essentially, uh, bringing their research and experience to bear, uh, effectively a sort of 10 minute positioning statement. And then we're going to have an open discussion among the panel for about 20 to 30 minutes or so. And then we'll have time for Q&A with the audience towards the end. So we'll have about 15 minutes for that, depending on how we go. Um, you can be part of the conversation on Twitter, it's worth saying, at, uh, use the hashtag IIPP Green Materials. And please also follow IIPP underscore UCL on Twitter. And you can send in comments and questions as we go using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If you just see that down the bottom there, you'll see there's already a couple of questions in there, which is good. <laughs> um, we haven't even started yet. So, um, Send those in as we go, and then the IIPP comms team will direct them to me towards the end. So, the format's going to be quite simple. We'll start with these positioning statements. I'm going to do a very brief positioning first, um, and then I'm going to hand over to Carlotta to set the scene. So, let me just share my screen, and I'm just going to describe what we're going to do. As I said, positioning, and then discussion, and then Q&A. So just briefly, from my point of view, I thought I'd, I, I have a hunch or I have some idea of what the panelists are going to speak to. I don't know what they're going to say precisely, but I know what they're going to talk about. So in, in that respect, I then I also changed uh, a little bit what I was going to say. So um, I'll just give a, a couple of minutes from my point of view around this question of materials and work through a different series of scales. And first of all, of course, uh, some of the work around materials has to consider this repair, recycle, reuse, retrofit, other words beginning with re, um, kind of end of the problem. And 
we know what this looks like in a way. This is in Sweden, in Stockholm here. Um, Sweden has an incredibly high recycling rate to some extent, but we also have a huge, what you might call, um, shadow places impact on the world. I think the feminist uh, geographer Val Plum would call them shadow places, as in we export a lot of our material use by having things produced overseas and then imported. Nonetheless, we've got quite good at using these things. Um, as a designer, I look at these and say, it's not the most welcoming, convivial space that we could make here. Uh, a friend of mine, Marco Steinberg, said we should make these recycling units transparent glass so that you can see what's in them. And that might be more interesting. And you could equally imagine a social interaction around these things and in effect celebrate the act of recycling. But there's a very strong culture here in Sweden, actually led through government campaigns in the 70s and 80s, where a vast amount of our material use at home anyway is recycled. Then there are firms like Asket, who uh, are a, uh, a fashion house, but their thing is that basically you have a very small wardrobe, which is all you need, and you use that for a very long time. And they've done a lot of work around transparency. Every product they sell has an impact receipt, which tracks all the way through manufacturing and material sourcing the impact, which is kind of interesting. This is, But this is a sort of a niche brand, you might say. It gets more interesting maybe with Nudie Jeans, which is a bigger brand, which has a lot of repair and recycle. Any any product you buy from Nudie, you can take back forever at any point and get it fully repaired. In fact, you can even take other people's jeans there, apparently. H&M are beginning now to bring that into their stores. This is then getting wider and more and more mainstream because it's not enough just to have, obviously, um, sort of niche fashion brands doing this. So the real impact is at the H&M scale. And I think Tanushri will pick this up in far more detail, the systemic impact of brands like H&M and many others in terms of where things are. But you can kind of see a, at least a, um, an awareness raising in the store around this is a repair center in Stockholm store in H&M. And in the building world, which I think Saskia might talk a little bit more about, um, and Carlotta, I, I should have known this, but I only discovered the other day you trained as an architect. Um, so uh, this is very interesting Belgian outfit who actually take materials from old buildings that are being destroyed and carefully catalog them and curate them and put them back into the market to reuse. So they're run by architects, which is interesting. And reusing materials is very powerful. Then there's behavior change. I'm, I'm also interested in this in terms of Energy use is an interesting parallel here. After the Fukushima incident, the Japanese uh, prefectures managed to achieve a 20 to 30, sometimes 40% reduction in energy use just through behavior. So how does behavior change change what we need to produce in the first place? We don't need to overproduce necessarily in the way that we have in the past through behavior change. We might look at the use of plastics, and plastics gets a bad rep for many good reasons, but then when plastic, when done well, I actually have this radio, it's from the 1960s, still works completely fine, you know? And this is a very powerful, durable object. Um, I worked on this product as a designer, the Punct Phone, which is this one just here, if, you can, if I wave it in front of you, in front of the lens. So this is made of plastic, but it's super durable. And this thing you only have to replace every, well, you don't ever have to replace it, to be honest, because it's, it's designed to be very simple from a technological point of view, so it doesn't become obsolescent. The battery life is weeks, if not multiple weeks, and uh, the product life could be a decade easily, because it won't go out of date in that sense, so it's kind of interesting. Then we have this kind of low-tech question, which I think is very interesting, and if we compare tech innovation around certain things. This is around sanitary um, infrastructure. This is the Gates Foundation-led work on the toilet of the future. And this is super interesting. This is the Omniprocessor in Dakar, which uh, recycles water and turns it into drinking water. So it recycles sewage and turns it into drinking water. But if we compare that to um, indigenous cultures and what Julia Watson calls nature-based technologies, which have been around for thousands of years, here's an example of a bridge built out of trees. It's um, even more compelling to look at things like the East Kolkata wetlands, which Tanushri will know way more about than I do, but a very interesting infrastructure does exactly the same thing as the Omniprocessor. So it takes sewage and turns it into water, it turns it into clean water, but it does uh, many other things. So I, I looked at what you do here. The Omniprocessor costs millions of dollars from the Gates Foundation, it takes 14 tons of sewage a day and produces thousands of liters of drinking water. That's a fantastic thing. We need those in the world, to be super clear. But equally, the East Kolkata wetlands uh, does 700 million tons of sewage a day in terms of that 
um, amount and it produces fish and rice and vegetables and feedstock and 80,000 jobs and so on. It, what did it cost? How do we know? <laughs> um, it's, it's absolutely constructed by humans. So it is a technology, but it's just using na natural infrastructure. So there's an interesting way of thinking about this. Uh, Wakanda is kind of an interesting idea here, which is almost a collision of these low and high tech solutions at the same time. So you have almost like high speed rail and also nature based technologies in this vision from the film Black Panther. But equally, tech gets used in the worst possible ways. This is a Swedish firm. Um, I gave some good credit to Swedes earlier, so just to take them away now. This is a robot lawnmower, which is doing the worst thing you can do with grass, which is cut it and sort of neuter it as a system. Uh, wooden buildings, again, Saskia might talk to that. Um, this is a project from Helsinki where we actually had to change the building code to enable wooden buildings at scale. But it seemed timber construction is incredibly powerful, uh, effectively a circular process. You can make amazing buildings from timber, which locks up the carbon. It's super attractive. This is what happened in reality. And by changing the building code, which was, again was a government-led, what I might call a snowplow tactic, it enabled many buildings to happen. This bit of Helsinki is now effectively being built out of wood. So the, the future may be wood as much as any other material. And then this is a project we're doing now, which is using wood in the context of street furniture. Um, so transforming the street scale in terms of wood in this way. So using materials like this enables a kind of recycling and adaptation through virtue of its choice. So finally, I'll finish just by talking about a bigger sort of macro picture here. This is based on work by the Oxford University geographer Danny Dawling. He has these amazing graphs. And to cut a long story short, you can read his book about this. He suggests everything is slowing down in an interesting way. Population growth is actually slowing down in most places. In fact, globally, it's slowing down. The rate of change is slowing down in the Indian subcontinent, in China. Um, world population is slowing down in terms of its rate of change, which actually undercuts a lot of the growth that we've got used to over the last several hundred years. It's a very different phase we could be moving into. Rate of innovation is slowing down. Rate of technical change is slowing down, according to Dawling. So it's a hugely interesting thesis. If you look at somewhere like Japan, which might be a kind of a lead edge of this, this is population growth in Tokyo. Basically, these little graphs mean that if you're spiraling on themselves, the rate of change is slowing down almost to stasis. And you can see Tokyo, which is the world's largest metropolitan region, is effectively in stasis now as a population. But then there's fantastically interesting innovation happening in the city as a result. So it's a, but it's a very different dynamic to suburban growth of the 50s or the early growth of the 20s and so on. And in Japan, of course, and, I, and again, I think uh, maybe Carlos and Saskia might touch on this. Um, there's, there's a very interesting use of materials there. This is the temples in Ise, which is rebuilt every 20 to 25 years out of timber. And the timber, again, being used as a circular use. And I like this quote from the Japanese designer, wood ages and rots just like we do. And we rebuild every 20 years, and it's through this constant process of renewal that something lasts forever. So this is the tension with the materials talk here we're going to get into now, which is this uh, growth and production versus not growing or slow growth and managed production versus recycling and repair versus rebuild versus material choice that you can rebuild within the first place. All of those things we might get into now. So I'm going to now hand over to Carlotta and Saskia and Tanushri. Hopefully uh, Saskia um, will sort out her connection issues if the IP guys are helping her. And um, but in the meantime, we'll start with Carlotta, and I'm going to hand over to you, Carlotta. Thank you, Dan. Well, after this wonderful set of imaginative solutions, my job is simplified. I have I'd like to communicate four main ideas. First of all, that in a sustainable world, materials are as important as energy. That dematerialization depends much more on our own lifestyles. That government is the one that can provide directionality to succeed in this huge endeavor. And a very controversial thing, we need to have everyone on board across the whole political spectrum and across the world. Otherwise we cannot succeed. So beginning with the notion of materials, I mean, in recent decades, the climate change controversy and the shift from fossil fuel to renewables 
has received much more attention than materials, which are in fact energy intensive and of limited availability. So we have two huge problems. They actually are part of what we're supposed to be resolving with um, renewable energy. Then the, the fact that, um, <laughs> sorry, I got lost. Uh, the shift to renewables happens to be a matter of public and private investment. It's mainly a big thing. You, you invest in solar and energy and all that, but the materials issue is very likely to depend on all of us. The truth is that humanity faces a gigantic challenge. We need to abandon the mass production paradigm, our way of living, those obsolete modes of excessive wasteful production and consumption have to become a thing of the past. And that will mean massive innovation, massive investment, massive change by all of us across the globe. The millions of people that are entering the middle class in China and Asia need a different model of prosperity than the so-called American way of life. In fact, unfortunately, the whole world is still copying the old American way of life because nobody has provided the new model. I mean, obviously from what we just saw, the Swedes are trying hard, but that is, well, trying a little. <laughs> okay, so what we need is to use information technology, biotechnology, materials technology, everything else that science, technology, business, communities, and citizens can deliver in order to shift to a smart green growth path in production and consumption. The task is mammoth. But the good news is that this terrible pandemic has created a situation similar to war destruction. So we're going to have to reconstruct and the reconstruction cannot just be a return to the past. But as the Davos people are now saying, it must be a reset. And it's very important for us to see the business community and understand this. And it is happening, fortunately, it's beginning to happen that everybody wants to know what's going on with the environment because they know that's the direction we're going to take. So as we come out of COVID, we need to use the opportunity to leap into production models and lifestyles that provide a better future for all. So how do we do it? That is the question. So what needs to be done? First of all, do we have to abandon comfort and make sacrifices? No, we reinvent comfort. We reinvent the good life as with each technological revolution. Otherwise we only get minority support. We've got to make life much better, a sustainable life, be aspirational, wonderful. So we move culturally from being couch potatoes to an active, creative enjoyment of life. We prioritize health, exercise, good food, healthy habits. We turn from possession to access or rental. I mean, what we need is the thing. We don't need to be owners. So we can use it when we need it. That includes cars. We appreciate quality and durability and look down on waste. You know, waste is embarrassing. Oh God, you're gonna throw that out? How could you? You know, it has to become culturally disgusting for people to waste. We enjoy and consume information and education and everything intangible. And we become, we change our mobility habits towards sustainability and become conscious consumers, reshape demand so that business knows that what people want is this sustainable type of living. So maybe some of you will be thinking, are you trying to turn the workers into middle-class consumers? Well, yes, there is the education, you know, the educated middle-class is already tending to go in this direction. But you know what happened after the second world war was precisely that the workers 
imitated the middle class thanks to a lot of government policies that made it possible because it was the middle class that had the cars, the TVs, the radios, the everything that the middle that the workers had afterwards, after the war, the educated and richer middle classes had before. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need the workers to also want to go to, you know, to, to go up the mountain or whatever, all these things that the current uh, educated middle class wants to do. We need uh, health, you know, to, of course, the workers do their own exercise. Some of the workers do their own exercise and the, they don't need to go to exercise, but they can do all the other wonderful things. So, what does this mean? Well, it means that business will be moved to respond to catering to such demand. They would then try to turn as many products as possible into services because people don't want things, they want services like we have with books, music and film now streamed. Uh, the circular economy, we will want them to reduce, reuse, recycle, etc. Innovate in bioplastics, biomaterials, all these things, wood for construction make durable goods truly durable and upgradable. There is no reason why a refrigerator couldn't last a hundred years. And if we shift to a rental and maintenance model of these long lasting goods, there'll be hundreds of thousands of jobs doing precisely turning, maintaining, uh, 3D printing the parts, all the things so that we keep goods so that more people can have them because you know if we were going to have five-year refrigerators for everybody in the world forget it we can't but if we can have hundred year refrigerators then everybody could have them so innovate in sustainable architecture town planning transport etc so on and on and on and on really how are we going to get people and business to change so much and fast enough to save the planet I mean, I'm talking about a pretty major thing. Well, let's go back to the initial question. How do we do it? Hmm? Governments do it. Governments must provide directionality through policy. If we look at every previous golden age in capitalism, it has always been led by government. That gives the direction, that helps in every way so that things go in the proper directions. We have taxation, tariffs, subsidies, regulation, and all possible mutually reinforcing instruments. We need institutional innovation, like Mariana's missions proposal. She's, by the way, bringing out a book, which will be very useful for this sort of thing. Public investment in infrastructure. We need good, cheap internet for everyone. We need low carbon transport for everyone. And it has to be those things are what really make it possible for everything to be intangible, to be able to put things on internet. And of course, we must support sustainable innovation. But it must be a win-win game between business and society. We need to get the workers on board. Let me tell you something. We cannot, must not, turn green into another wave of job destruction. We need to make it a wave of job construction, well-paid employment creation. If we don't do that, forget about the assault in Congress. We're going to have it everywhere. And they're right, because they've already had three waves, technology, globalization, and COVID. Are we going to get the green wave now to destroy jobs and skills? You're mad. We can't. We mustn't. We've got to make sure that our strategy for green, whatever we propose in whatever stage, whatever position we're in, we've got to make sure it's a job creating strategy. And the other obvious thing is that we have to get business on board. It must not be a set of regulatory hurdles and pains and taxes and horrible things. No, we need a set of encouraging signals with good consequences for business. So that if we put taxes, we put taxes on the bads so that they move to something where we are making it easier so that they can actually both create the jobs and do the things and make the changes that are needed. 
Also, it must be an empowering context for all citizens and a test for politicians. With action from the local government through the regional, through the national to the global, including people, including the community, we need global things too. We need a multi-level structure for this huge transformation. We need to win massive support for technological and social innovation towards sustainability with transparency of information about success and failure in attaining the goals so that politicians, must, you know, they have to really respond to this demand of the great majorities. And finally, it must avoid a race to the bottom between countries or regions. We cannot have one country super strict on green and the other country super over. No, that's if we do it that way, we'll never get there. So we need to, within each country, balance in incentives and restrictions. Then we need to have clear and stable multi-party strategies. Yes, we have to sit down, the left wing, the right wing, the center, the whoever. We need to say, this is what we need. This is the strategy we're going to follow and we must all agree. It doesn't have to include very complicated things. It just has to include the green things and the policies that will make it profitable for business and good for workers. So by having clear and stable agreements, we will be much better so that if a government changes, it doesn't change the green policies. We need stability on the policies. And also by arriving on multi-country agreements, we're not going to have uh, business fleeing to, to the easy countries. And eventually, you know what? We need global institutions to guide the world transformation process. Of course, we already did the Paris Agreement. We already have the United Nations Development Goals. Great. No, we need something with teeth. We need something that will be a real agreement where if somebody violates it, they're in trouble in the International Criminal Court or something like that. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but it's got to be serious decision because this is a very serious problem. It's an existential problem. So the size of the planetary problem determines the size of the solution. So I've been talking a lot about green, but I haven't said anything about the social agenda. Am I giving up on the social agenda? Do we not focus on reducing inequality as so many of us would want to? Well, let me tell you, of course, we need to fight for the new welfare system for reducing inequality for universal basic income to guarantee uh, a jobs guarantee program, uh, all the things that, you know, that are really, we can't give up on that, of course not. The probability of succeeding on those goals is probably greater than ever now because of what we're saying about the pandemic and about the previous. But the problem is that we need everybody to agree on saving the planet. So what we do is that we all agree on the planet and then we fight about the social things. And that way we can make sure that we're going to get to the end. I also happen to believe that based on historical experience, better times are truly possible now. These four horrible decades in terms of social differentiation, inequality, all this thing could be over. Historically, this is what has happened. The post-war boom, life was better for the majorities than the unequal roaring 20s and the depression of the 30s. So I am convinced that we can now construct the golden age that is sustainable, much fairer, and also global. Thank you. Thank you, Carlotta. Um, that's fantastic. I feel like we could just sort of write that down and uh, email it to everybody in the world and then we'll be okay. But <laughs> um, it's fantastic. Thank you. I mean, such a good wide ranging, um, but positive and optimistic and, and fierce and powerful. Um, agenda. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to actually pass to Tanushri now, uh, just to, while we're um, uh, the comms team are working with Saskia to get her online. So I'm just going to hand it over to you, Tanushri, to, to talk from your perspective. Um, 
So over to you. Thank you, um, Carlotta. That was so inspiring and, and rousing. And I feel like I, I really can't go on after something like that. Can I? What can I say now? I feel like we should be done now. <laughs> You're, you're doing the parts. Each one does one part. We've yeah. got, we have a, each one has a role and I happen to be the big picture person. You, you definitely <laughs> That's are. That's my role. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely are. I'm so grateful that you've kind of set that, that big picture. Um, I'm going to go way on the other end of the spectrum, I think, and talk about like my little piece, right? Uh, I absolutely agree with you. Each one does their little piece. And I think if we just focus on that, we will really be okay. Um, the little piece that I, for some reason, have decided to pick is, is textiles and apparel. Um, and of course, I, I live and I work in India, and so my perspective is a little bit more limited also by where I'm from, um, India, but also South Asia, um, and just looking wider at the global South overall. Um, and when we talk about the climate crisis, um, and when we talk about all of these issues of sustainability, and also when we go down to talking about textiles and apparel, um, this is the region, the global south is the region where the, where the negative impacts are kind of unfairly felt and experienced. Um, south Asia, Southeast Asia are the world's capitals of uh, manufacturing, um, apparel manufacturing. Most of the clothes that most of you are wearing um, were probably made in India or in China, for instance, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia being other countries. Um, and, so, and so this is a conversation that's very, very relevant to, to the global South. So first of all, it becomes kind of a political, social inequality, wealth gap kind of conversation already, right? Um, also, when we talk about textiles and apparel, um, and we think about materials and think about it in the context of materials, um, you think fiber and you think fabric, right? So it seems, oh, okay, fiber, fabric, that's it, that's the material issue to resolve and then we're good. But textile and apparel is, is kind of a, an industry that sits at the heart of, um, one of the industries that sits at the heart of the overall global climate crisis. And if we were to talk only about materials, it's so much more beyond fiber and fabric. So even just within textile, there's your natural fibers and your man-made fibers. And there are new ones being produced every day. There are new blends, new combinations that are being produced every day. And so it's this ever widening scope. Um, and so just as soon as you figure out how to like recycle one fiber, there's a new one that has already come out, right? So it's, it's, it's a widening and increasingly complex kind of space. Um, but outside of just the fabric itself, there's you know, the plastic that goes into your packaging, there's the fuel that's running the trucks and, and, the, and the logistic systems, there's the metal that's going in you know, the rivets on your jeans, for instance, there's the coal that's being burned and, you know, in the factories and the suppliers as the leather industry, which is a whole other thing in itself, you know, relating to, to livestock and the meat industry. Um, and so really materials and the, and the challenge and issue of materials and textile and apparel is all materials, all natural and man-made materials. Um, and I just want to kind of say that very obvious thing so that we understand the, the width and the breadth of, of this issue, right? And why this, and why looking at this industry really matters and why it is such an impactful industry, why it is widely called um, the second highest polluting industry in the world, although that is a slightly debatable kind of factoid that is, that is out there, um, but it's definitely high up there, right? With aviation and oil and, and you know, those kind of guys. Um, Unfortunately, the, the, the fashion industry, where you talk about textile and apparel and you're talking about the manufacturing and the supply chain and all the boring stuff behind the scenes, but what you're seeing in front is the fashion industry, which is exciting and glamorous and awesome. Um, and apart from being really fun and glamorous, it's also done a really good job of making all of these things invisible. Um, as far as the customer is concerned at the end of, at the, end of the chain um, of all of these materials and processes and this extremely complex supply chain, um, you know, they're clicking a button, they're receiving a new dress, same day delivery, free shipping. It's this amazing, um, you know, efficient system that seems to just work. And so you don't really question it and you don't really think about it. Um, but, but this is the challenge with, with fashion and with textile, right? You have to take something really fun and glamorous and you have to force people to kind of look at all the boring stuff behind the scenes and really think about what is, the, what is the carbon footprint of your same day delivery? 
what you know your free shipping is not free on the planet and is not free for the people who were the millions of people who were involved in getting this in your hands in in 12 hours um and so we need to kind of like open the curtains and you know take a peek behind the runway and kind of see what is really going on there and unfortunately there's quite a lot of mess you know um i feel like my statement is going to be far more pessimistic than carlotta's that was so rousing and and optimistic but maybe i'm just more of a pessimist kind of character um but that's also what enthuses me personally to work here and to kind of you know look at the look at the issues um and of course as dan mentioned in my introduction i i work primarily with textile waste so i i spend a lot of my time just thinking about waste and thinking about garbage and you know it's not fun at all um but uh, but the waste issue is kind of kind of a really big one and it it feels like oh, okay if you're using plastic or if you're using polyester and if these are bad materials we can just replace them and with good materials um and there's a lot of movement right now and a, you know kind of a, a rousing movement happening in india especially around uh substituting cotton with hemp for instance so cotton is an extremely resource intensive crop uses a lot of fertilizers a lot of pesticides a lot of water quite harmful in the land it's cultivated on um the 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 livelihoods and conditions of the farmers growing cotton are extremely problematic and difficult um and hemp is just just represents a much better option for instance you know this is just one example um unfortunately um in india um the entire supply chain so so it's not as simple as a brand just sitting somewhere and saying oh you know what cotton bad let me just replace it with hemp and start making hemp clothes today uh when that brand starts looking at its suppliers and starts looking at their infrastructure at their machinery at their resources they're going to find that the entire supply chain is a cottonized supply chain the machinery for instance is incapable of weaving hemp fiber um and so there's this complete kind of systems change and systems redesign that is needed even for a simple um material switch or replacement like that um and 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 so on and so forth you know when you start looking at other materials and other examples you find that there is this complete interconnectedness of the supply chain that is extremely complex um i think i i read a statistic the other day that said 90% of brands in existence today don't even know where their suppliers are or where their products are being made or who's making them under what conditions um that's how complex the global supply chain has become you know and it's 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 not it's your tier one suppliers but then also it's being kind of uh, you know what's the term it's being subcontracted out to a tier two and a three and a four and it goes on from there and it's almost impossible for a brand for a large corporate brand uh, today to know where their products are being made and and what's being done with them um and so how do you make that kind of transformation you know if you want to change from cotton to hemp you have to change a whole lot of things in that entire chain um and that's what kind of that's the reason why the organization i work with and and why we focus a lot on the circular economy and carlotta you mentioned the circular economy as well um and and kind of the 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 fundamental base on which the circular economy rests is the concept is of interdependence and of interconnectivity um it is an economy it's not just a checklist of things that you hire a consultant to kind of implement for you at an enterprise level um yes the changes you make at as an enterprise matter but also you know it, it, what i love about the circular economy in a philosophical sense is it really does rest on the fact that we have to build bring everyone up with us um when everyone grows everyone grows you know it's as simple as that um and so that that interdependence and that interconnectivity um of not just you know supply chain is boring but of all human beings of all materials of the of the global climate crisis of the global south so all of these kind of bits and pieces all need to be part of the conversation when we're talking about materials and when we're talking about textile and apparel and i think if there was one takeaway um i would want to say it's just that you know that that interdependence and that interconnectivity of all things um and to think about it just just much much broader fantastic thank you tanushree and um you didn't seem as pessimistic as you were perhaps thinking you are <laughs> um in that it was realistic and and you also gave some really clear suggestions about the scale of the change i think that's common to both of you carlotta and tonushri i mean we're talking about complete systems redesign and we can see that as a powerful motivating optimistic mission 
to borrow Mariana's language, absolutely. Um, and I get that sense from you, absolutely, that this is something that's driving your work. So uh, the pessimistic thing to do would be to run away from it and not do work with textiles, but you're doing the opposite of that. So <laughs> um, so, so, thank you, that was so, so interesting. And it's so interesting also to hear this difference between uh, the two of you together, actually, is a very good counterpoint, so with a very similar message. So I'm going to, um, we've been struggling to, to get uh, Saskia online technically but I'm just gonna now just switch to now a discussion between the two of you really and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna also interject obviously um, Carlotta I might start with you because um, again you give this very powerful sense of almost um, using this problem we have as an enormous opportunity to to actually address some of the as you said the last I think you said the terrible last four decades, which, um, you know, those of us that look at carbon emissions and things or global inequality, as you say, absolutely, the last four decades, we can say, I think David Wallace Wells put this well, is that's where all the damage has been done, actually, in carbon in particular. People think it's kind of a 200, 250 year, you know, 300 industrial revolution problem that we've been belching out smoke all of that time, which is, of course, true. But it's the last four decades that the real damage has been done, which is kind of a fascinating point. And as you say, that's been running parallel with inequality because they are the same thing. They're not separate questions, the question of social justice and environmental justice, absolutely the same. So I'm really interested in then your sense that we can in effect almost, I don't want to say throw the system into reverse, but we can we can reverse the dynamic and address the questions. And so your lovely example of the 100 year refrigerator, I, I love because it's such a simple, strong idea. And it's a bit like this phone that I worked on again, which is, you know, designed to last 10, 20 years instead of two years, ideally. It's still a smart, well, it's a cell phone. It's not a smartphone, actually, um, on purpose. Um, but that's such a massive shift of mindset, isn't it? To go from, a, I think you said, a four-year refrigerator or something, where the jobs are front-loaded in the manufacturing and the design and the sales, but then it's fire and forget, in a way. You know, you then buy a refrigerator and get rid of it, and then it ends up on a rubbish dump. And instead, switching towards this kind of care and maintenance job creation, where there's an ongoing then job creation, actually over that 100-year life of the refrigerator, and I literally like your points about COVID and the COVID in a way has, if it's raised one word, it's been care. Um, we've become incredibly aware of that, of course. We're always aware of it, but it's been put front and center. But w where do you see we are on that kind of shift of mindset, the shift from four years to 100 years, the shift from jobs in manufacturing, production and sales versus jobs in uh, an ongoing service relationship based around care and maintenance? How, in, you, you refer to Davos, but that, you know, how far have we got to shift these crowds in terms of their mindset? It's almost 180 degrees, right? You know that technological innovation, technological progress happens in a very particular way. Almost every technological thing you can think of begins very slowly. And it looks like it's not going to go very far and you don't know how far it'll go. And suddenly, boom! It takes off, and then there is diffusion. There is, you know, there is lo lower cost. What happened with solar with solar energy? You know, it began really expensive, really difficult, really doubtful. You know, and now it's so cheap. Of course, there is the manufacturing thing in China, and the fact that the Germans put all the money for subsidies at the beginning. Of course, it doesn't happen like in the air. It happens because governments and investors and technologists and the man and people all contribute in that direction. So the first thing we have to know is that if it's very slow, it doesn't mean it's not going to get fast. There will be some point at which it can get fast, but that if it does it on its own, it's not gonna happen. So first of all, we shape technology. We push technology. We force technology because we force business, because we force demand, because we, you know, and there is government action and all that. So that's one very important thing. Where yeah. are we now? Very far from that. You know, very far, it could be 10 years, say. But in 10 years, we could be making a big thing. Just think, internet has only been with us since 95, practically. 
in fact, between 95 and 2000, it was, you know, pretty, pretty much nothing. It's after 2000 that it took off. And that's nothing. I mean, how many people are 25 years old? Mm. <laughs> it's young, 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 young. It's mm-hmm. nothing. Mm-hmm. It took so little mm-hmm. to get to this incredible spread. So that's another thing we have to learn. Technologies yeah. sort of surprise us in how fast and how far they can go under under certain circumstances. In this case, it so happens that uh, this is the revolution. So yeah. Yeah. green is not a revolution. Green is the direction in which we can take the information revolution mm. and, and the emerging biotechnology revolution, the emerging materials revolution, both of which depend almost totally on information management. The possibility yeah. of designing new materials, the possibility of ev- all those things, everything in biotechnology depends on computers and on information intelligence, I mean, on Mm. artificial intelligence and all sorts, all these things. So Mm. we are talking about giving direction to something that already exists. Mm. The potential is there. Mm. Science is ready to use it. We just need to fund it. We need to make it more profitable to invest in those things than invest in the others. So again, how long can it take? Well, it depends on how much money we put into it, how much regulation that that moves people, not regulation that's that stops people from doing things, but regulation that moves people in the good direction. Yeah. So okay. this is this is the situation. I want to clarify one thing. Yeah. You said that uh, the carbon and the inequality were the same. I'm not sure that's true. What's true is that every technological revolution for the first two or three decades, this time it has lasted much more, brings inequality because it's destroying the old, you know, Schumpeter called it creative destruction. It destroys the old and it creates the new and that involves people and regions and all sorts of things. So we have Trump and Brexit and all these things as a result of the fact that so many people are rightfully resentful because they have lost what they had and their future is bleak and their children's future is bad. So we have all these political phenomena that come from the inequality that results in the first few decades of every revolution. Hmm. So that's the thing. Now, why did carbon increase more recently? Actually, because we did not abandon mass production. Mass production was carbon intensive, materials intensive, all that. That brought us the the big golden age. But all the decades after that, what happened was that China, Asia, all these new countries came up doing what? Copying Mm -hmm. the model that was supposed to have been mature and should have been replaced. And Mm. was not replaced because these countries didn't even belong to the system before to the Mm. market economy. So there is a very peculiar condition and and those two things are not necessarily the same. So, I mean, I'm sorry theoretical clarifications, but it's very important not to confuse because lots of people are talking about, we need to degrow, we need to stop growth. And no, we need to change the nature of growth. We need to change, we need to make it intangible. We need to get everybody to be better off by a better use of the planet's resources, by all these things I've been talking about, we've all been talking about. But, Absolutely, yeah. Hmm. No, it's, uh, yeah, if, I, I completely... If you, think, if you put the two things together, then we have to solve them together. No, we don't have to solve them together. We solve them, each one, in it, their nature. Interesting, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to Tanushri and ask the same question in a way about fashion, textiles, apparel, etc. But in two ways, one, one is where do you think the industry, if you can generalize, because I know it's a massively complex, fragmented industry, but and you describe the supply chain very well. But are we to use Carlotta's analogy, the Internet in 1995 or 2000 or 2005? You know, where where do you think we are on that curve? And then if I can speak to speak to India, because it's such a or the subcontinent, at least it's such a powerful base of production, as you said and source of materials. Where is the 
I think we heard from Carlotta the role of government here. Where, do, where would you perceive the government is in understanding their leadership role in the way that Carlotta described around fashion and textiles and materials? Yeah, um, I mean, Carlotta is so right. And, and I, context is everything, right? And cultural context is, is, is to me, perhaps one of the most important, uh, important things. And in India, what, what I can see with the industry right now, and I think what all of us are seeing is one of the biggest problems is, especially with, with fashion, we have imitated the models of the West. We have imported mm. them and embraced them because in India, as with a lot of countries in the global South, the American model or the European model is really, you know, the, the aspiration and the aspiration we were taught to have. That was a lifestyle that we've been told to aspire to. Um, and in India, especially, you know, the, the economy was kind of closed to uh, until the 90s, until the early 90s. So we didn't have any international brands. We didn't really import much. Um, we didn't see Coca-Cola or, or, you know, anything in, in our market. So, so my upbringing, for instance, was very local, very hyper local, in fact. Um, when it came to our clothes, we were, we were tailoring everything, we were hand darning, we were repairing, you know, we were living quite a circular kind of, uh, you know, life in that sense. It is when the economy opened up and when ready-made garments started coming in, this was very new to us in the 90s. Yeah, we, we were only used to buying fabric and stitching our clothes. And it sounds amusing to somebody from the Western world, but this was new to us. Um, and this came in and we just embraced it, you know, because here's this ready thing. It costs a fraction of what, uh, you know, half of what I, what I need to get stitched. And I have it immediately. I don't need to like spend all of this time. Um, and we didn't think through the implications that this was going to have. And, and we've ended up in the situation that we have today. So, so we've always been a really, we've always been a global manufacturing hub and that continues and that's, you know, provides a lot of jobs and, and, and is, uh, you know, the textile sector and the manufacturing sector especially contributes to our economy. Um, and it's very important for that to continue. But now we're slowly becoming this consumerist society, but we're becoming consumers in, in the way that the West is telling us to become consumers. And that's what's problematic. Um, you know, we, I was reading somewhere recently and it completely blew my mind. I was reading about single use clothing. I mean, we all speak about single use plastic, but there is now such a thing as single use clothing. And this is happening in India now. Um, there are brands coming in who are selling extremely low cost, extremely cheap products that are made only to last one or maximum two washing cycles. You're going to wear it and you're going to discard it after one wear. And this just like gives me goosebumps. So this is actually a thing now. And this is a thing here. Um, and when it comes to, you know, the second part of your question, the government, the Ministry of Textiles and the government is doing some amazing work in India. But the textile industry in India is kind of divided into, into these two large pieces. There's the apparel and the garment manufacturing. So the, the clothes that are selling in your, you know, the H&M store and, and all of those brands that you showed, a lot of them that are being made here, that's one big industry. Um, and then you have the handloom industry. And we're one of the few countries that really still have a very robust and very vibrant industry, which is completely carbon neutral, which is just literally hand weaving of fabric. And this has traditionally been a thing. Now the government is doing really, really good work with the handloom industry. And it's really focusing on kind of uplifting these weavers organizing them, um, you know, connecting them to the market and making sure that that, that handloom doesn't die as a craft form because it stands at risk of that also. But when it comes to this more organized industry, which is private sector, which is catering to the global brands, um, it's a little bit hands off there. And that's where the problems are happening with, with the garment workers. You know, you look up garment workers and you see it's just across the board, doom and gloom and, and, and just really painful to see the working conditions. Um, mm. So, and so that's the part that now needs a little bit more intervention from the government. Um, where the government has done really, really interesting work is in plastic. So plastic and plastic waste has had this, has had this amazing trajectory. Um, and I can see that level of maturity of its understanding as a waste form, where today a common man who's not even literate knows a plastic bag is bad. I shouldn't use it, you know, even if it is that extent of understanding, which is fine. We are nowhere near to that extent of understanding when it comes to textiles and fabric. We absolutely do not. So we kind of need to, what I'm, what I'm looking at and I'm thinking about a lot these days actually, is how do we look at that trajectory of plastic and how do we take textiles and fashion along that same trajectory to the point where we end up with an EPR policy, for instance. Um, Dan, I think I mentioned this to you, there are only two countries in the world that have an EPR policy and extended producer responsibility around textiles. It's that rare. 
So, um, so we need to kind of follow that same path. Which countries are they out of interest? Uh, Sweden and France. Okay. <laughs> I should know one of those. It's so <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's really interesting. And we, we actually, we've got a couple of questions from the audience just to remind people that they can hop in from the wow. audience um, as well to ask questions directly. So Tanushri, just to follow on, we've got a couple of questions again from the audience already, actually. But is this a kind of, um, do you see this uh, as a labeling system from consumer demand kind of question? So you just described about the knowledge of plastic. But plastic is also very easy to demonize, as I tried to show in my introduction briefly. I mean, plastic can be an amazing material, which is super durable, which will last longer than us, you know, in a frightening way. So if you use it carefully, beautifully, it's um, arguably more sustainable than, you know, something thrown away. But it's how much of that is around consumer understanding and labeling and then equally can you imagine social movements getting off the ground that would really be able to sort of curtail the industry? Someone just asked very directly, if 30% of consumers stop shopping at ASOS tomorrow, you know, like the big online fashion place, what impact would that have? I mean, could you imagine those kind of shocks into a system like that as a tactic? Or is it, what, what stage are we at again in sort of Carlotta's curves here in, in yeah. terms of? Yeah, um, I, I think, I mean, it's a little bit different in sort of global south and global north, right? Um, but it's still nascent. I would say that we're kind of at an early stage. Um, Carlotta spoke about the creation of the conscious consumer, and that's very much something that needs to happen. Um, and we're kind of at the level of a very base level awareness, especially in these parts. Um, there are these kind of isolated movements and, and consumer facing movements um, led by amazing nonprofits um, like Fashion Revolution, for instance, you know, which, which is doing some really, really good work around educating people around worker conditions. Um, mm. But it's still very nascent. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason it's nascent is not necessarily because of the, um, and this is where the interconnectedness thing comes in, not necessarily because consumers don't want to be sustainable. It's not like somebody is going out there wanting to be equal or pollute the planet, um, but because there's a lack of information, there's a lack of information in creative and interesting ways that appeals to consumers. Um, the label you showed from, from ASCET, for instance, very, very, very small little, you know, kind of design intervention uh, yeah. to drive the point home at that point of purchase. Um, there's, you know, we need to kind of get people comfortable with talking about carbon emissions in the context of clothes they're buying. What's my carbon footprint when I'm, when I'm purchasing this piece of clothing? Tell me that at the point at which I'm purchasing this and more brands need to do it. Um, mm. And, and uh, so there is definitely that gap. And as soon as that gap is filled, and also that, that sustainable products are just more expensive, unfortunately, because again, that entire supply chain needs to redesign and a lot of changes need to happen. Um, and so at the moment, we are, we are at that point of you know, initial where it's still very expensive and kind of inaccessible, but that will change. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we were to fill that gap, I feel like if 30% of people stopped shopping at ASOS, um, that would be that would create a huge impact. That would create a huge impact on water, on carbon emissions, on human life. Um, very positive, but we cannot forget that this is that there will also be a negative impact. There are a lot mm -hmm. of jobs that are created. There are a lot of people who rely on this industry. So I, I don't think it's as easy as just saying, okay, hands off. Although that would be great because. I'm sorry, I hate to demonize ASOS here, like not, not my example, but like, you know, it would be forced to shut down as a brand or as a company, which may not necessarily be a bad thing. But what happens to the labor and the, and the millions of people in their yeah. supply? You need to think about that. Yeah, no, I think you both make that point very clearly as well. And also the, the, the rate of development that we're at, it might be expensive now, but as Carlotta says, these things are not expensive when they're done at scale on mass and delivered well, technically. And I, I got a question in the Q&A and I won't answer it. I'll just mention that's the same with timber buildings. And this is my uh, DJ style link to Saskia, by the way. But um, the wooden buildings that we worked on in Helsinki, uh, wood as a building material at scale like this, this kind of cross laminated timber was, is, you know, has been up until very recently more expensive than building in steel and concrete for the industry because they optimized around steel and concrete for many years, decades. They're super good at it. But now those those costs are kind of crashing down and down. It's becoming sort of equivalent. So, so these you can see these shifts happening. I mean, as Carlotta said very clearly in her thesis, um, 
So that's very interesting. So Saskia, I'm going to pass to you because we talked. I talked in my intro a little bit about cities and buildings. Obviously, it's a huge source of materials. It's a huge driver of carbon emissions associated with the materials. They can last for a very long time. I also showed in Tokyo that buildings get pulled down every 25 years on purpose. <laughs> so, you know, you can also to go that way. It also can be sustainable to do that. So, Saski, do you want to spend a bit of time yes. just giving us your position on this topic? Yeah. Yes, it's, I, I must say, I heard the two former presentations. They are just wonderful. And I must apologize that oh, I have no a question, but it turns out that there was a, there is a glitch in my new computer. And so I'm now here at Richard's. Um, it's fine. I would like to sort of start with, uh, with the notion that the complex systemic and multi-scalar capacities of cities are a massive potential for a broad range of positive articulations with nature's complex ecology. So I really want to make that connection because we tend to think of course of cities as being the ultimate destroyers uh, of the natural environment. And so in, in a way, of course, they are destructive. We are destructive. We humans, the moment we stepped onto our planet, we became destructive. But at the same time, there are ways and intelligences nowadays in play that can sort of minimize, if you want, or reduce that kind of... Um, so cities, then in that sense, you could just argue that cities are a, a type of social ecological system that has an expanding range of articulations with the biosphere's ecologies. Till quite recently, we were quite ignorant about that possibility. Now, of course, in the last 20, 30 years, people have become aware of the importance of that. Now today, still, most of these articulations produce environmental damage. So it's less than it was, but it's still there. How can we begin to use these articulations between nature and our environments, which are materialities mostly, right? So how can we begin to use these articulations to produce positive outcomes? That doesn't mean eliminate all the negatives, but positive outcomes that allow cities to contribute to environmental sustainability. And that in a way is a big challenge, you know, because yes, right now they are actually destructive. But how can they contribute? And I think there are quite a few interesting uh, experiments going on now that could turn that around. Uh, so in some ways, what we could say is that cities are multi-scalar, complex elements, and they contain and enable diverse ecologies. In other words, this would be a very nice positive way of trying to make it work. Um, so multi-scalar in the sense of the diverse terrains and domains onto which cities project their effects and from which they meet their needs. Ecologies of cities in the sense of multiple mechanisms and feedback loops of urban processes. Once we begin to take some of that more seriously, we will be, and, and many people are by the way, but it's still a minority. Uh, but it will, we will gain something vis-a-vis -vis also how to protect nature and, and be uh, sort of articulations between these urban ecologies and nature's ecologies. So in that sense, the city is a multi-scaler in the geography of the environmental damages it produces. So it is a way of, if you want, confronting also the question of the damages, you know, you lay out, so there are two vectors in play. One is destructive and let's just face it, we're always going to need cement or something equivalent to cement. But the other one shows us a pathway, if you want, into another way of thinking. Now, some of this is atmospheric, some of it is internal to the built environment of the city as might be the case with much sewage or disease. And some of it is in distant locations around the globe from which we extract what we need. So we are, in some ways, we could say all over the place for good, but mostly for bad. Uh, now, it is also multiscalar in that today its demand for resources, our demand for resources, generates a geography of extraction and processing that spans the globe. 
I already said that, we're everywhere. It does so in the form of a sequence of confined individual sites that are distributed worldwide. When you sort of look at it as a certain type of map, a map that necessarily does not, that does not necessarily mention the specificities, you really get the sense we are everywhere, we are distributed worldwide. Of course, there are concentrations and there are places where there are almost no people, but th there is something that we have occupied this planet. That is really what I'm trying to get at here. So this global geography, which I see as a geography of extraction, instantiates in particular and very specific forms, furniture, jewelry, machinery, fuel inside the city and all the fuel things. So the city is one moment, the strategic moment in this global geography of extraction. And it is different from that geography itself. Now, it's partly the maker of that geography, but you cannot simply say one is the other. Um, mm. Now, at the same time, maybe because of that combination of elements, that combination of presences, cities mobilize new kinds of social ecological systems. And they have been doing this for a very long time. And that to me is also interested. A lot of the, the systems that we have developed are more self-confined, more enclosed, whereas the city is this, it's inevitably an open system. It cannot be a closed system or then it's not, it's not a city. So as social ecological systems, cities often have planetary reach. That's another feature. You know, that marks a difference. For instance, the impact of cities on traditional rural economies and their long-standing cultural adaptations to biological diversity. Uh, rural populations have become consumers of products produced in the industrial economy, one much less sensitive to biological diversity. You know, and the, the list goes on and on. The rural condition, the, the rurality, if you want, has evolved into a new system of social relations, one that does not work with biodiversity. And that's loss. There was a time when biodiversity was, you know, the, the what fed it. Now scaling, the, the capacity that we have today for scaling, you know, that wasn't always there. Uh, but scaling generates new eco-social systems. Um, so this is, of course, environmentally speaking, the damages can be enormous. It includes damages that may involve non-urban scales and origins, but gets constituted in urban terms. In that sense, the city is one place for damage, for concentrating damage. Mm. Uh, I love cities, but you know, you cannot get uh, beyond that. <laughs> So CO2 mm. emissions produced by the micro scale of vehicles and coal burning by individual households, all of that and so much more becomes massive air pollution, covering the whole city with effects that go beyond CO2 emissions per se. Um, is it agglomeration and density as such that does that? I would say no, because I also think that we need to keep on uh, building in ways that agglomerate and densify so that we avoid mm -hmm. destroying vast stretches of what is still, you know, healthy land. So in this sense, mm. for me, that is important, even if it is partial, it is clearly mm. always destructive, no? Um, mm. So it is the contents we have historically and collectively produced that are also in play here. So specific types of systems to mm. handle it all. Mm. Transport, waste disposal, buildings, heating and cooling, food provision, industrial processes through which we extract, grow, make, package, distribute and dispose of all the foods, services and materials that we also want. Uh, and the processes of past dependence, which keep eliminating alternatives as we proceed it. Once we entered in systems of past dependence, we build our own, if you want, prisons, and it becomes more difficult to exit uh, from that. Now, 
I would just want to very briefly, and I know I'm, it's a bit late, so I'm going to make this very short. I just wanted okay. to explore a few alternative configurations. Now, what would it mean to reorient the material and organizational ecologies of cities? We need to use and build upon those features of cities that can reorient these material and organizational ecologies towards positive interactions with the biospheres, with the, with the, the ecologies of the biosphere. So that we can do that, but it will take, you know, resources, etc. There will be contestations, there will be losers and winners. So again, it's a battlefield. Now these interactions and the diversity of domains they cover are themselves an emergent social ecological system that bridges the city and nature's ecologies. And so how can we use those bridges that connect these diverse worlds? Now, I like this image of delegate, and I've written quite a bit about this across the years, this notion of delegating back to the biosphere what she does well, because we have not done that. And we could do much more on that. Rather than short circuiting biocycles with problematic technology, we can delegate back to the biosphere. So there is there are all kinds of possibilities there. You know, I, I don't need to list them. We're all familiar with what, what they are, and and um, and we know that trees, etc., can reduce the need for internal climate control. There are also psychological and health benefits. Uh, there is the notion that the values of land, urban land would increase. You know, there is a bit, one could say, for all different types of potential interested people. Now, I just wanted to, and I'll stop finishing. I have been very interested with how the Japanese in Japan, you have really already for 20 years, extraordinary innovation. I mean, Japan is almost pure cement and pure rock. Right, we know we have a visual on that. So they have had to deal in a way uh, that we in the West did not have to. Um, and so they have developed an extraordinary list, and I just want to run very quickly through them, of various ways of how to produce the needed materials. And so here, one of them is quite known, and probably some of you know about it, this notion of self-healing concrete. Huh? Uh, so bacteria residing within concrete structures seals, cracks, and reduces the permeability of concrete surfaces, uh, surfaces by depositing dense layers of calcium, carbonate, and other minerals. Now, this is all natural stuff that, for instance, in a city like New York, I've never seen them use it. Mm -hmm. In Japan, they do, of course. Human structures would thus more closely model the self-sustaining homeostatic physical structures found in nature. Uh, and here I have a whole series of sources that I would happy to, the Dutch have been very good at this. Um, mm. Now, another, another quick example. You can send them round, Saskia, that would be great. We can send yes. them round to attendees. Absolutely, and then algal wastewater processing. You know, a lot of the wastewater could be used much better than it is. So using bioreactors, essentially controlled ponds, you know, to put it in simple language, uh, mm. that combine bacteria and algae. Nitrate contaminated water can then be cleaned and gaseous nitrogen and N2 huh, can be recycled into the atmosphere. Uh, and really there, there are a whole bunch of people who have come up with a very long list of these types of innovations that of course require a bit of, you know, uh, you probably have to be in a university to, to get it done easily, but, but because, you know, there are costs involved, etc. but they would really make a difference. Another one that I think is extraordinarily interesting is algal fuel generation, which is a kind of carbon sequestration. This is a very complicated story. I'm not going to describe it. Then there is solar mm. paint. Traditional solar panel technologies are hindered by their high cost of production and their rigidity, et cetera, which limits the, case, the ease with which they can be integrated into human settlements. No, yeah. no solar energy capture technologies rely on abundant and inexpensive components and production techniques. I mean, yeah. you can do this. So one field of research is the development of solvent-based photovoltaic devices, also known as solar panes, nanocrystal yeah. inks, printable photo 
uh, voltaics, etc. Now, I have a long list of these. I'm not going to read it to get the picture. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I am just going it's to... A shop, it's a shopping uh, list for us. I want to turn... I mean, that's right. But we should all know about it. Uh, yeah. so, and so I just want to end with this, with this notion. Non-scientific elements are very important in cities. Let me end there. For those of you who are interested, I will send you them because it really will Thank you. No, thank you, Saskia. That's so good. And, it, and it's, um, it's an equivalent in a way what Tanushri was talking about around materials in textiles and fashion. And, and, and I started a bit with talking about nature-based infrastructure. So I'm really glad that you've closed the loop there, actually, which has been super nice. That was a complete um, coincidence, just the audience at home. Um, so, but it's really good. And, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna open up to Q&A from the audience and um, well, I'm gonna get pinged them in the chat from the IIPP team, I think. There's, there's one or two in already. But I'm gonna ask one that came in earlier when you were talking Carlotta, and it really builds on this sense that I think also Saskia was just talking about how do we do this collaboration in systems as opposed to in, let's say, national borders or pretending the urban regions have a kind of some kind of hard border? When in fact, as Saskia points out, they're directly connected to rural economies, they're directly connected to natural ecosystems. They are the same thing, essentially. They have different dynamics, but they're directly connected. I like Timothy Morton's point on air conditioning. He says, when you put air conditioning on a building, it's not like it makes the air cooler in general. It just moves it outside. <laughs> so, you know, the air, the air is still hot in the world because it's all the same thing. We just moved it somewhere. And so uh, this you pointed this out, Carlotta, at the, at the macro level, at the national level. You said we need countries to come to agreements together about this. We can't have one economy being the air conditioning unit and the other economy having to pick up the hot air, right? So one of the questions that came in was from an attendee in Buenos Aires. I don't know if that's relevant. I guess it might be because they were asking, how do we make these international agreements um, for the long term when the differences between center right and center left are so different? He, he or she says, or they say in Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, etc. And we could ask Saskia as well, the difference between a city-based political leadership and a national-based political leadership, often completely different, they're in the same thing. So Carlotta, like, uh, in the absence of s strong international bodies, you know, we have a weakened UN, we have uh, maybe not all the bodies we need in place. How might, how do you see us going forward to come to these international agreements? I know that's a massive question, but... Have a go. <laughs> I begin by saying that unfortunately, we're not really only talking about center right, center left. We unfortunately are talking about populist, extremist, left and right. <laughs> so uh, the worst is that we have a big hole in the middle. We don't have this center right, center left situation, which we had 50, 60 years ago. So uh, the first thing we need is to start populating the center. And for that, we have to have policies that are attractive to those people who are now following the populists who are offering heaven, which they cannot deliver, but it doesn't matter because if you're so angry, I mean, remember we had, we had Hitler and, and Stalin offering heaven in fascism and communism at the time. And lots of people felt that that was the solution. And we had a horrendous war to, to get rid of fascism and then a long time to get to a point uh, where we're supposed to be having democracy and we don't because it's not really true and democracy isn't this wonderful heaven either. But it is true that social democracies have made the best use of capitalism. I think we have all the examples of Sweden. Of, and, and even right now, we see that some of the countries that are most successful, both with the pandemic and with social conditions are precisely those that are more sort of social democratic center mm. uh, politicians. Mm. So uh, one of the problems is that we need to populate the center. And how do you populate, this, populate the center? by offering realistic proposals that will, and examples. Because mm. one of the very important thing that this 
new paradigm, if we, if we think of the information technology paradigm as contrasted with the mass production paradigm, mass production paradigm was based on identical units, as many as possible, because the more you had of the same thing, the more, the cheaper it would get. But of course, it also meant waste and it also meant uh, you know, you can have any color as long as it's black, really meant that you had to have this enormous, big uh, production units and, and have the whole thing, all the materials moving from everywhere. And of course, keep the third world producing cheap materials. So that whole model is no longer necessary because, first of all, these technologies tend to go towards intangible, even though they picked up the mass production model they still haven't gotten rid of it, but they can. Mm. It is possible to get rid of that model. It's possible to think of, and of course, if we can turn all electricity into renewable, then it won't be so bad. But especially they're doing, you know, planned obsolescence and all that stupid stuff. But that's also because energy was very cheap in the 90s, which is when this these industries decided what their business model was going to be. Yeah. So they will change as the world changes towards green, they will have to change and they will do mobile mm. phones like the one you showed. And th this is going to happen. We can be mm. sure that it will happen. But that's not as, you know, that's the simpler part. The more difficult part is precisely this possibility of getting agreement, even within countries, but especially between countries. Yeah. Uh, for the welfare state, there were completely new institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, which, by the way, it's only now that we think it's really bad, but at the beginning, it was wonderful. And the World Bank was really lending and people were really getting money to do infrastructure, to get electricity to everybody all over the third world. Uh, sorry, people don't even know what the third world is anymore if they're, if they're under 30 so uh, <laughs> or under 40. <laughs> Yeah. So the developing world, the global south. Uh, so those institutions have rotted with time. Even the UN has sort of rotted also. You know, it has lost its original uh, purpose and it's, they have lost, they, they fell into this free market austerity madness, which made did so much harm. And then they haven't been able to straighten it out. And then, and, you know, if we look at the current world institutions, we can be very depressed. However, that doesn't mean that we can't invent some better ones now, create better ones, but we have to find the reasons, the purposes, the way to do it, and then create new institutions that will respond to the needs we now have. Absolutely. So I'm going to just in the interest of time, I mean, I could list Carla Lotter, I could listen to you for the next four hours, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to. Um, Tanishri, and I'll come to Saskia in a moment, just as a closing question, perhaps just think if you can uh, give us any ideas around cities and regions that you think are beginning to work in this way. That Carlotta said, because there's the national level. And then, the, as I said, there's the cities within the nation and cities across nations in bio regions and other formations. So I'll come to you in a moment to so have, have a think. But Tanushri, again, from the, an Indian perspective, or you don't have to stay in the Indian perspective. I don't mean to do this. But are there, are there cities uh, or other entities leading outside of the national government that are worth us being aware of that are kind of creating the space or filling the middle, as Carlotta said, to enable the innovation we know is just poised? As we've all said, we've all listed some of these technologies. Everything's kind of in place, more or less. So we need to, again, work like a snowplow, we might say, in Sweden, whatever the Indian equivalent of that is, I don't know. But like, how, who is in India below the national level or in the subcontinent or in the world of textiles and fashions is working in that way? Not an H&M or a, or a manufacturer or a Benetton or whatever, but in this space in between that might create the, the space or the appetite for people. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's... I think it's organizations like like the one I'm working in, for instance, which happens to be, I think, one of two organizations that is looking at implementing, really implementing on ground the circular economy. Um, mm -hmm. And we're essentially a consultancy, right? 
um, mm -hmm. but we've kind of taken on board this this particular space and decided, you know, let's not just think about it and produce research about it, but let's really try to make some action happen on ground. Um, and, and, and like I said, there are just two or three of these organizations. What's interesting is that all of these two or three organizations are funded by European foundations. Uh, right. we, 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 we are grant funded almost entirely and, uh, and our funding is not coming from Indian sources or, or from any countries here, you know, so we, we are looking at, at the Netherlands, we're looking at, at you know, the, the, the Swedens and the Frances of the world uh, who are implementing these policies and who are seeing that sustainable business is good business um, mm. and fortunately the foundations are, are kind of filling those gaps for us. Um, I do wish that would change, um, not just from the perspective of philanthropy growing in India in these spaces, but also private sector investment. I mean, that's what we really want, right? Um, we want this, we want the organizations, you, you said not the H&Ms and Benetons, but, but ultimately when you're talking about a profit-making industry, it needs to invest in itself and it needs yeah. to take responsibility for the waste it's creating. Uh, some of these brands we've spoken about are now putting in small margins of their profits to, and are being celebrated as solvers of the problem that they have created in the first place. Um, and and that, that equation just doesn't make sense anymore. No, that's really interesting. And it, I mean, it does occur there's a, if Global South were able to lead th this way through this, it would be, it would probably generate more interesting solutions, I suspect. Uh, there's a lot of uh, fantastic lean innovation. Solutions, lean solutions as well. I mean, we are, yeah. like India is the kind of capital of entrepreneurship. We have the highest number of startups. Um, compared to any country or the second highest number of startups, I think, compared to any country in the world. Um, mm. And we are really lean and we are, you know, Jugaad, that term in India that we use to do more with less. And, and, and that, that, you know, that innovation is really happening. It needs money. Absolutely. And a recognition of that as a valid solution, I think, as well. That's why I mentioned the East Kolkata wetlands as a kind of technology. And when you see it as a technology, then it becomes suddenly appealing. Otherwise, it gets built on for urban development. So, yeah. and then, so last word to Saskia. I know we're running out of time, but hopefully people are okay with going over by a couple of minutes because it's just so interesting hearing you all speak. And um, so Saskia, this question again, are there... Um, are there formations of cities or cities working in a more sort of systemic way, understanding their relationship with the regions around them? Or as you said, this interplay by recognizing that we are the same as nature, we're directly connected, we are nature. So it's not, an, it's not a binary opposition. Um, are there cities and regions beginning to work in this way, forming con, you know, clusters and agglomerations themselves, do you think, around these questions? Yes, I think there are two. There are three very different actors in my perspective. In, in the world, three, three modes of doing that. So one is, is of course, uh, Europe. Europe has managed itself quite differently. I mean, there are some negatives in there too clearly from say the United States, right? So Europe has managed to be a very successful, to have very successful outcomes uh, that were more protective of nature and at the same time has enabled a better life for most of its residents. We in the United States, we in Latin America, I grew up in Latin America, which is one of the most brutal places in the world, as we all know, and they could really benefit from some of that. And these are modest interventions. I think that is one thing. Then there are the more rarefied discoveries and innovations that are happening in, in you know, mostly in universities. How do we diminish some of the damage that we do? And that is a very long list, and it is an incredibly interesting set of options. I mentioned a few, like this notion of self-healing concrete, the algal wastewater processing, self-cleaning buildings with the lotus leaf effect. You know, the Japanese have been marvelous at that. So when you put it all together, and I think now I'm a professor, right, at university, you know, all those hundreds of students that I teach, you know, there are always a whole bunch who get very intrigued when I give this lecture, you know? Mm -hmm. so I can just see, whereas the older people like at a dinner party, forget it, <laughs> you know? So I see a new generation that is just way ahead of us in sense of the energy, the interest, the motivation, and the persuasion. We can do this, you know, something like that. So, mm. so but I also, I just want to emphasize again, the level of ignorance for very distinguished professors, you know, I am at a very good university, when it comes to all the options that we have to do it better, less destructive, that I gave you that short list, but the list is actually very long, to me yeah. that's shocking. 
it is shocking that we're still encased in certain modes of understanding. So there is real work to be done on a whole variety of levels. Yeah. No, I think yeah, we're going to leave it there, I think, because that's a really... Yeah, yeah. That's a really good note to leave it on. You talked about the optimism coming in the next generation, the optimism in this set of technologies that are sitting around us ready to be deployed. But then the work that we all have to do in all of our different areas to open up to those possibilities and make them happen, to understand that it's entirely possible. And so um, and I'm going to say the information, diffuse the information. Absolutely. The information to get to everybody. We don't That's right. have, exactly. You know, Trump yeah. and Twitter was very successful. What what are we going to create? That's <laughs> no, we almost got through the whole talk without mentioning that guy. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, thank no, almost you're in, gone. almost gone. Uh, no, almost. And anyway, thank you, Carlotta. I think absolutely. So this was in the spirit of dissemination. And so this this conversation with you three amazing people was about um, sharing your knowledge and experience with a crowd that we very active crowd that have joined us tonight. There's a ton of questions there uh, we didn't manage to get to. Again, we could have spoken all night clearly, um, but this will be ongoing work for IIPP. So um, Ryan's just to say thank you to Carlotta Perez, to Tanushri Shukla, to Saskia Sassen. Thank you so much for your time and your energy and your enthusiasm and your passion. Um, we'll, we'll keep going and do this work. Uh, stay in touch with IAPP. Uh, this, work, this work will carry on there. It'll be uploaded to YouTube, specifically this talk and various other platforms, of course. Um, follow on Twitter and all of those sort of things you're supposed to say at the end of talks like this. But uh, thank you again for uh, joining and keep an eye on the IPP website for more. Thank you and good night.